those with us that have never met Brother Adam, or those on our online uh, community who have never met Brother Adam, uh, I wanted to formally welcome him, and then I'm just going to give it to him, let him do whatever it is he feels uh, led to do. Uh, but Brother Adam Davis is with us, um, as well as his uh, helper. You call him your helper? <laughs> Associate, your scribe, the assistant. Okay, his uh, no, they uh, brother uh, Zach Whiting um, uh, helps brother Adam Davis with his uh, youth ministry. But uh, brother Adam has been teaching at uh, uh, Bible College um, in the ministry and Bible department, right? At Veritas Baptist College for ten years. He's actually ninety-seven years old. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> Surprise. Uh, but, uh, but for a time, Brother Adam also served as chairman of the department before leaving uh, to travel uh, in full-time evangelistic work. Uh, I met Brother Adam as a student. I met uh, Brother Zach as a classmate, and uh, I'm thankful for their friendship. Uh, the reason I asked Brother Adam to come and to speak to us was because of his background, because of his knowledge. Uh, Brother Adam does have a Master of Ministry degree as well as a Master of Biblical Studies degree with a concentration in Biblical Languages. And as far as I know, he's working on the third one, right? So he's working on your div, right? Your MDiv? So he's starting his PhD in January. So it was kind of obvious why I asked him to come and do this instead of me, okay? Um, he is much more educated, much more learned, has uh, a great deal of teaching experience. He's a great teacher, um, and so I believe it would be helpful. Uh, he also is the founder and director of Keep Your Heart Ministries, which we support. A great ministry, working with youth, and I'll let him talk more about that if he desires, but that is where Brother Zach comes into the picture uh, as the assistant director for that ministry. Um, and he has spent, together, they've spent years ministering to teens and their families and helping churches and equipping churches and leaders so that uh, we're able to continue in the Great Commission and, and specifically working with youth. So I'm going to ask Brother Adam to come. And, uh, sir, you just do whatever you feel led. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Pastor, for having me. And I'm, you know, I'm no stranger to Heritage Baptist Church, though it's been a little while. This may be the longest gap in the history of my relationship with Heritage Baptist Church uh, because of COVID. It, I was supposed to be here in the summer. Um, two different times <laughs> kept getting uh, canceled because of all the uh, craziness. But we're just so thankful to be, to be back here. And we love Heritage Baptist Church, and we, we love your pastor. And, uh, and normally, you know, we, we come here and we get to do all kinds of different things, revival services, vacation Bible schools, revivals, boot camps. But this is a, a first um, for me, actually. Uh, this is the first time for me to come to a church specifically to do a conference like this. I've done Bible conferences on a number of different topics, and, um, taught, of course, for 10 years on this and other topics, but to come to a church for this specific purpose. Uh, this is a first for me, and so I'm excited about the opportunity and glad that it's here with folks that we love and, and appreciate so much. And uh, like always, even though this is a, a little bit different setting, my goal is always to be an encouragement to you folks and, and a help to you. And this is going to be a little different because it's more teaching, but that's right where I live, so I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable with that at all, and hopefully you're not. Uh, and I hope you're ready to get the most out of this. And um, that means I hope you're ready to take some notes. Do we have good note takers here? Um, we're, see, we've got people with notebooks and ready to go. I saw some other people coming in ready to take notes. Uh, I want you to, to kind of view this as some kind of uh, class setting. And we might, uh, one of these nights, take some time for questions um, though there's some very specific things that, that I want to get through, so uh, we'll see if, if we have time for that. But I want you to approach it that way. I want you to have, your, I want you to have a Bible ready to turn to some passages and, and read. We want to get this straight from the source. 
I don't, I'm not here to tell you what I think about current events. I'm not here to tell you what I think about prophecy. Uh, and I'm not here to tell you my, uh, my idea of how it's all going to unfold. That, none of that matters. Uh, I'm here to focus on what is clearly taught in Scripture. Because we spend way too much time speculating about things that aren't clear. Um, and it, it becomes a waste of time. In fact, the Bible even warns us against that kind of needless speculation and the arguments that come from it. Um, we're going to go directly to the Word of God and see what is clear. Because when we focus on what's clear and we obey what's clear, that's when we, we know we're doing what God's asked us to do. Uh, he hasn't entrusted to us the responsibility of figuring all this out. He's already figured it out. Uh, and it's happening according to his plan, and we can be confident in that. We just want to know where we fit in all that. And so that's what we're going to be dealing with. And I'm going to be dealing with, uh, especially tomorrow and Friday, some very specific topics that I know people are interested in. We're, tomorrow, specifically, we're going to be talking about what the Bible teaches about the rapture. Well, yeah, and we've probably all heard of the rapture. And there's a, a huge constituency of people, not just lost people, but people within the church who do not believe that this event is going to occur. Uh, so does the Bible teach that there will be a rapture of the church? Is it a second, a separate event from the second coming? When is it going to happen? All that we're going to deal with tomorrow. And then we're going to, uh, the next night, Friday night, deal with the, the tribulation, the Antichrist, and the second coming um, as much as we can with those details. But tonight we're going to be really foundational and deal with uh, an introduction to the topic of eschatology. Eschatology is uh, a fancy word for the study of last things. The study of last things. Within the study of, of Bible doctrines, within the study of theology, uh, which is technically the study of God, we have all these different branches of study, and they all come from different Greek words. Uh, and this one comes from a Greek word, eschatos, which means last. And so it's the study of last things. But before we can dive into any of the details, we need to lay a foundation for understanding uh, the last days and understanding Bible prophecy. Um, prophecy has a lot of, probably a lot of things come to your mind when you hear about prophecy. Um, it's important for us to note that um, there is no ongoing uh, prophecy at this moment. The gift that was given to individuals during the time of the foundation and building of the church, uh, the ability to, to predict the future, the gift of prophecy is gone. The Bible tells us that gift would cease, and we believe that it has because there's no need for us to go to any specific person who can give us new revelation about God because we have the completed word of God. This is his revelation of himself. And so we don't need any prophecy ongoing. So when you hear prophecy conference, that doesn't mean I've come to prophesy. <laughs> no, it means well, something that might have gotten more people. Uh, but I'm not good at it, okay? Um, none of us are because it's, uh, it doesn't happen. I'm here to tell you what the Bible has already prophesied and understand how that's unfolding in the days in which we live and where we fit into that. There's also a lot of intimidation surrounding the study of prophecy or eschatology because right away our mind goes to those chapters of Revelation where we read about all these beasts and plagues and, and all those woes and terrors and we, we have a hard time wrapping our minds around all that and the symbolism that is definitely there and so we get intimidated by it and so some people will never go to the book of Revelation because they're scared to death of it. In my experience, there are two polar opposite reactions. There are the people who avoid revelation altogether. I'm not going there. I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. It's scary. And then there are the people who dive in there right away. <laughs> They're like, if I'm going to say the Bible, I'm going right to revelation. Let's see. And then, then they, they get in the deep end and they get a little bit out of their league. But we don't want to be discouraged from studying prophecy. I remember Dr. Forrester who founded Virginia Baptist College, which is now Veritas Baptist College, uh, an incredible um, man of God, and by the way, the foremost expert, in my opinion, on eschatology, and he has for years taught those courses at our college on both the undergraduate and graduate level, but he talked about when he was a young man, he lost his sight when he was nine years old, 
uh, but he knew that God had called him to preach, uh, and his pastor, unfortunately, at the time, kind of discouraged him from that. Basically, you know, you need to find something you, that you can actually do. <laughs> but he also remembers that pastor, though he knows he had good intentions, he told him basically not to worry about the book of Revelation. And he told him something like this. He said, basically, it's just a story about good and evil, and good wins in the end, and that's all you need to know. Don't worry about it. Um, and that's some people's approach to the book of Revelation. It's all just, it's all just an, uh, you know, an analogy. It's all just metaphors for the battle between good and evil, and ultimately God's going to win. That's all we need to know. No, there's, there are more specifics than that involved. But his point was that he was discouraged from studying the book of Revelation because he was told, basically, you'll never understand it, and so don't worry about it. But he ignored that, and he dove right into it anyway. And what he discovered within the first few verses of the book of Revelation is that the book of Revelation has a specific promise of blessing attached to it for those who read that book and who obey its principles. So he wondered, why am I being told to avoid a book that has a specific blessing attached to it? Obviously, God doesn't want us to shy away from it. He wants us to be able to understand it. But there are a number of things we have to understand before we dive headfirst into Revelation. Okay? We need a basis of, uh, of, of how we can create a timeline and a skeleton, and then we can come back and put all those details in place. Uh, so let's jump into that foundational study, shall we? And there are gonna, I'm going to put a lot of stuff on the screen for you. Hopefully that will help. <clears throat> and there are going to be some, uh, some words maybe you've never heard before. We'll make sure they're defined and so you can follow along. But let's go ahead and start with what we call the um, millenarian views. Now, if I can get this to show up on the screen, that would be awesome. See it there. All right. The millenarian views. You say, what in the world is that? I'm glad you asked. Uh, these are the different ways that people view the millennium, which is a centerpiece of Bible prophecy. The, uh, the reign of Christ on the earth in the future, um, which we believe is a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ upon the earth. But there are three major views on the millennium, and wherever you fall in those categories will completely change how you approach the rest of the events of Bible prophecy. And so we have to kind of work through these first and figure out what's going on. So let's start with the first view, which is called amillennialism. Amillennialism. That's a big, long word. Now, if you know anything about language, the English language, which borrows from, from other languages, normally when you stick an A on the beginning of a word, it means no or, no, or not. It negates that word. And so when you see the word amillennialism, your first instinct is going to be to recognize that's, that's the idea that there is no millennium. And that gets us close to the definition, but it's a little more nuanced than that. The basic idea of amillennialism is that the millennial kingdom is being fulfilled in the church during this present age. So the millennium is, is happening right now. We're living in the millennial kingdom at this moment, according to amillennialists. Christ is said to be ruling over this kingdom in the sense that he rules in the hearts of believers who are on the earth, as well as over the souls of the saints who are already in heaven. And so the millennium is happening right now, and Christ is going to come after it. The millennium will end with the second coming of Christ, then all the judgments and all the resurrections will take place. And after that, the eternal state, uh, the new heavens and the new earth, all of that will be ushered in at that point. Now, the term amillennial, which literally means no millennium, is not actually a denial of a millennium, but it is a denial of a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth sometime in the future. So they would say, yes, there is a millennium in a sense, but not a literal one. Because when we hear millennium, what do we think? 1,000 years. But they say, no, it's not literal. We shouldn't understand it as literal. 
But instead, we should see it as symbolic of this entire age, which we call the church age that we're living in right now. So there is no literal thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, there are different reasons why people came to that position. Uh, one of the uh, foremost theologians uh, around the time when this began to be popularized and is still quoted to this day, especially by those who hold to Reformed theology or Calvinism, was St. Augustine, or Augustine. Depends on who you ask. Fancy people like to say Augustine. I just call him Augustine. St. Augustine uh, was a, uh, a leader, a, a church father, they call him, someone who wrote widely on the subject of theology, and he began to influence this idea that there would be no literal millennial reign of Christ. And there were a couple of different reasons why people came to this conclusion, um, which kind of help us to understand, because right now, I don't, well, first of all, I don't know what your background is. I grew up in a church where premillennialism was, was a cornerstone of everything we did and said. It was on our church sign. But I also know that there are a lot of people who hear premillennial or amillennial or postmillennial, and they don't have any idea what that means. And then as I got older, I realized that's the majority of people. It's not a, as big a deal to most people as, as it is to those who are constantly studying and in a certain uh, circle of churches that, that make that a, a big part of their identity. But I grew up, of course, believing in a literal thousand-year reign of Christ sometime in the future. And so it's strange for me to hear that someone else believes that there would be no such literal reign of Christ in the future. So how do they get to that way of thinking? How do they, reading the same Bible that I read, come to that conclusion. And it basically happens because of uh, the way they interpret the Bible. Now, we believe that the Bible should be interpreted literally. That doesn't mean that there is no uh, symbolism. It just means that you understand symbols in the normal way they would be understood in that language. Like, we use symbols all the time. We use figures of speech. But you understand what I mean because they're a normal part of our language. Do you, know what, you understand what I'm saying? So when the Bible uses symbols, we can still interpret the Bible literally because we understand that those symbols had a specific meaning, and people understood that. But there's another way of interpreting the Bible that was popularized, and that is the allegorical interpretation, which basically means everything in here has a secondary spiritualized meaning. So every story I read from the Old Testament, there's some secondary spiritual meaning understanding of it. Every detail of the story connects to some spiritual theme, and that's just not the case. Some narrative is just literally telling the details of the story. Not every detail has some spiritual connection. It's just, a, it's just an account, a historical account. But they started using allegorical interpretation of Scripture and taking promises that God made literally to the people of Israel and spiritualizing them and making them apply to the church because they didn't think, for one thing, that God was actually going to follow through on his promises to Israel because they had rejected Christ and they've been temporarily set aside. During this period in which we live right now, which we call the church age, Israel has been set aside, but they are still God's chosen people and are still due the promises that he made to them back when he made the promises to Abraham. But they, were, they didn't see that as a possibility. And so in an attempt to, to help God <laughs> in their thinking, they thought if we take those promises and instead we make them apply to the church in a spiritual sense, then no one can say that God didn't keep his promises. But they didn't have enough faith to believe that God would literally keep his promises in the exact way he said that he would. Now, you have to remember that it wasn't until 1948 that Israel was even back as an organized nation, again, on, with any sovereignty of their own. They had been, ever since their, uh, their scattering in Bible times, they had been a people without a country. They had been scattered abroad. And so it looked like, from, from their vantage point, especially in that part of history, that there wasn't going to be any regathering of Israel and there was going to be no way for God to establish a kingdom there because it didn't exist. And so they started finding ways to explain around it and still be able to believe the Bible. 
And they came up with an allegorical interpretation of Scripture, which leads us to an amillennial perspective of God's kingdom, that it's a spiritual kingdom and it's happening right now. That way God is still doing what he said he would do, but it wasn't literal. That was one of the major reasons they came to that conclusion. Uh, Augustine's other reason, or primary reason in fact, was that he believed it was sinful or carnal for believers to desire a literal kingdom. And the idea that we would be looking forward to reigning with Christ and being seated in places of authority with him was a sign of carnality on our part that God never intended. And so in his estimation, this, the kingdom was always to be a spiritual one, not a physical one. So that's how we ended up with this idea of amillennialism. So there's, according to them, there's no literal thousand-year reign of Christ at some point in the future. There's another alternative to that. It's called postmillennialism. Postmillennialism, and, and the word postmillennial conveys the idea that Jesus Christ will return after the millennium. You say that, well, that's what the amillennial people said. The kingdom's happening right now. Christ comes at the end of it. What's the difference? There are some differences. Let me continue explaining what they believe. They do generally agree with amillennialists in holding that the millennium is not to be understood as a literal thousand years. Some postmillennialists believe that the term millennium applies to the entire period of time between the two advents of Christ, meaning from the time Christ came uh, and was born in Bethlehem until the time he comes back to establish his kingdom. But others believe that the term millennium applies to a golden age of peace and righteousness that will be ushered in at some point as a result of the preaching of the gospel having gone on for a certain period of time. So postmillennialists believe that the, the days in which we're currently living are actually going to develop morally and spiritually until a golden age arrives and we will literally usher in a millennium whether it's a literal thousand years or not, they don't care. It's a golden age. And then once that golden age has been ushered in, Christ will come back to that earth, create his kingdom here in the midst of those circumstances. So the difference between amillennialism and postmillennialism, too many syllables, it's been said, is optimism. <laughs> That's basically all it is. Postmillennialists believe we actually, as the human race, as, and especially as God's people, are going to actually be able to uh, make the world a better place so much so that then we'll usher in a, a kingdom of peace and prosperity and then Christ will return in those circumstances. Now, a couple of things stand out as red flags with that, at least I hope they do, and that is the world is not getting better, it's getting worse. And no matter what we do, that continues to be the trend. Also, that's exactly what God said would happen. God did not say that he left us here so that the world would improve to a point where it was, where it was then going to be okay for him to come back. He said, no, wicked men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Things are going to get way worse before they get better. And the only reason they get better, by the way is because Jesus Christ will have come back, defeated the enemy, and established a kingdom where he reigns as king, literally on the earth, and the rule is that of peace and absolute righteousness. That's when things get better. They don't get better because of us. Now, as Christians, we're called to be salt and light, which means we hold back the corruption to a certain degree, and we bring light to darkness to a certain degree, but we do not technically improve society to a point of perfection. It's not going to happen. And so they'll be waiting a long time if they anticipate that's the way it's going to work out. But according to Scripture, things continue to get worse until the church is taken out of all of this. That's when literally all hell will break loose on the earth. And it's not until those seven years of tribulation have taken place when God is judging the earth, that then he would come back and establish his kingdom. So that's post-millennialism. We're going to usher in that millennium, a golden age of peace and righteousness, and then Christ comes back. 
Now, obviously, I do not agree with either of those views. And the view that I hold to, and I know that your church also holds to, is what we call pre-millennialism. And I've given you a little bit longer definition here because there are some specific details you need to, you need to be aware of. According to premillennialism, Jesus Christ will return to this present earth, not a golden age of peace and prosperity, but he will return to this present earth prior to the establishing of his millennial kingdom. So it's premillennial, again, because it's, it's how the coming of Christ relates to the, the kingdom. So he comes, then he establishes the kingdom. Jesus will reign supreme in power and great glory, and he will be the object of worship for all mankind. That's what the Bible teaches. The kingdom will be on an earth where the curse has been removed and where righteousness, peace, and prosperity are universal, not because of our influence, but because Christ the King sits on the throne and has banished evil and is ruling with that as his rule. Now, People on the earth aren't perfect at that time. People being born at that time will still make their own choice. But no one dares rebel against him during that period of time. And it's only because he's there, not because we have done anything to bring it to fruition. Prior to the millennial kingdom, there will be a resurrection of, of unbelievers. And the primary purpose of this period of time is to fulfill completely the covenant promises made to Abraham and his descendants. And when this kingdom is over... The next phase of God's kingdom, which is what we call the eternal state on a new earth, will commence. And we arrive at these conclusions because of the way we interpret Scripture, which is why it says that this position is based squarely on a consistent, literal hermeneutic. It's a, con a hermeneutic, by the way, is, a, is an approach to interpreting Scripture. That's all that word means. Hermeneutics is the science of studying literature, or specifically in this case of studying the Bible. And so our hermeneutic is consistently literal. And that means it's, we interpret everything literally, not just as long as it's convenient. And then we come to something difficult and we say, let's spiritualize that so we can make sense of it. No, we consistently interpret the Bible literally. We believe that because of that position, the promises made to Israel have not been fulfilled in the past. And so if God is, as he says he is, the one who never goes back on his word and always keeps his promises, and if they haven't been fulfilled in the past and they aren't being fulfilled today, then they must be fulfilled sometime in the future to a regathered nation of Israel. Which also means that the nation of Israel in our thinking, and the church must be kept distinct as two separate entities. We have to be very careful about this. A lot of bad theology comes from taking everything that God said about Israel and then applying it to the church now. That's not the way it works. Uh, and that gets us into a lot of trouble. And so premillennialism honors that distinction between Israel and and the church. And it is one of the primary ones that sets it apart from other systems of theology. All right, so those are the three basic positions that will radically influence how we approach all the events of Revelation, the book of Daniel, of course, being of primary importance also in our understanding of, of the last days. Here's something else we need to understand as a framework for the future. And that is the covenants that God made with different individuals and with the nation of Israel throughout history. A covenant is an agreement made between at least two parties. You understand that. Uh, it's a binding agreement, a legal agreement. Technically, according to God's definition, a marriage between a man and a woman is a covenant relationship. It is a binding relationship. And so God has bound himself to specific promises to the people of Israel. And that is the basis for then everything that's going to unfold in the last days. 
It's going to be his outworking of the promises that he made. So we need to understand these covenants and how they work. So that's what we're going to do right now. First of all, we need to see the, uh, the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is um, called the Abrahamic covenant because it's made with Abraham. We could just say the covenant made to Abraham, but it's more fun to have words like Abrahamic, okay? <laughs> so the Abrahamic covenant is a covenant made with Abraham. Now, let's look at some scripture here. If you've got your Bible, go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. When we study the book of Genesis, we will find that there is a, an incredible turning point in human history that takes place in Genesis chapter 12. The first 11 chapters of Genesis deal with God dealing with mankind in general. We have the creation. We have the fall of man. We have the flood. We have the establishment of, of human government. We have the Tower of Babel and God's disbursement of people all over the earth and the confounding of the languages. All that is dealing with mankind in general. But when you get to Genesis chapter 12, the story changes and it's now God's dealings with one specific person and his offspring. And that person is Abraham and those offspring are the Hebrews or the Jewish people eventually who came to be known as the the people of Israel. Genesis chapter 12, we read how this began. Verse 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So this is the beginning of Abraham's story with God. His name has not been changed to Abraham yet. It's just Abram. God often changed people's names to show that there was a work of transformation he had done and was doing in their lives. And so Abraham is called to leave the only life he knew to start going towards a land he didn't even know where it was, God said, go towards the land, I'll show you. And that was going to be the land that he promised to him and to his descendants. And the, the really important thing to note is that Abraham didn't have any children. And God's already talking about a land that will be his and his descendants. But he's old and has no children. But you know that's no problem with God. And Abraham would come to learn that as well. Look at chapter 13 and verse 14. It says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Look now at chapter 15. Verse 1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, or count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto, them, unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him, for righteousness. So here he just continues making these promises. Abraham, you've got to trust me. I'm going to provide for you a son, and from him will come a seed that is as countless as the dust of the earth and the stars of the heavens. Chapter 17. 
And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee. He goes on the rest of that chapter. We won't read it for time's sake, but he talks about the covenant he's going to make. He establishes the sign of that covenant, uh, which would be the circumcision of all the male children. Then look here in chapter 18 as this continues to unfold. Verse 17 of this chapter. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. In one final place, Genesis chapter 22. Abraham was finally given that promised son, Isaac, and then faced the ultimate test when God asked him to offer Isaac up as a sacrifice. And of course, Abraham followed through because he trusted God. Chapter 22, verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven that's the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Over and over again, we find God confirming this with Abraham. This covenant was established between God and Abraham and his descendants, Isaac, and then Jacob, whose name would be changed to Israel. And from his 12 sons would be those 12 tribes that make up the nation of Israel. There were three basic areas of provision made in the Abrahamic covenant. First, there was the personal blessings for Abraham. Personal blessings for Abraham. So there was going to be wealth that came along with this. There was going to be greatness. His name would be known. He would have this son, and from that son, many descendants. So there were, there was, there were personal benefits promised to Abraham in this covenant. But secondly, there were national blessings specifically for his descendants. So specifically for those people that came from his son Isaac and his son Jacob, there were specific blessings for them that had to do with the land they would be given, the kingdom that would be theirs, very specific promises to his seed. But that's not all. Thirdly, there were universal blessings for all people because he said, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So in choosing Abraham... God was not excluding other people from the benefits of these promises. He was using Abraham and his seed as the vehicle through which these blessings would, be, would make their way into the world. Because ultimately, it was through Abraham's seed, through Isaac's seed, through Jacob's seed, all the way down until the birth of Christ himself, that would be the means through which all humanity would be saved. And so the blessings were not just for Abraham and not just for his seed, though there were specific ones for them. The blessing reaches to all people. In these ways, God promised to bless Abraham and to make his name great. Now, there's no question that portions of this covenant have been fulfilled already. The promises to Abraham of personal blessing have been literally fulfilled. The Genesis record, as we read it, testifies to that fact. But it's also true that key portions have not been fulfilled. And because this is an unconditional covenant then we know that they await their fulfillment in the future. It's important to note that the Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional covenant, meaning there are no conditions placed upon it. This is not a covenant in which God says, if you do this, I will do this. No, God says, I'm doing this. And so it is unconditional. In fact, if you were to read the passage where the covenant ceremony takes place, there was a a whole uh, scene that unfolded and a whole ceremony of making a covenant which involved dividing uh, the, the sacrifice and then walking between it. Typically, 
both parties in the agreement would walk between the pieces of that sacrifice. Abraham did not walk between the pieces of that sacrifice. Only God did. In other words, this, this covenant is conditional only upon God. So though it's made with Abraham and his descendants, in a real sense, the covenant is made with himself. He is honoring a promise he made to and of himself. It will not be broken. It will come to pass. And so whatever of it hasn't been done yet, we can expect will be done in the future. As we move down the line, then we would come to the Mosaic Covenant. Now, in great contrast to the Abrahamic Covenant, this covenant was conditional and was temporary. Meaning, it had blessings and cursings based on how the, the children of Israel behaved. If they obeyed it, they would be blessed. If they disobeyed it, they would be cursed. They would be removed from their land, and they would be, be scattered abroad, and that's what happened. It was a conditional covenant. They did not keep up their end of the bargain, and so it was broken. It was also temporary in that it was designed for a specific period of time. The Mosaic Covenant was made between the Lord and the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. It was not a covenant agreement that included Gentiles, but it was literally Israel's constitution, giving them laws and ordinances to guide all aspects of their national life. It was never given as a means of salvation for Israel or for anyone else. That's made abundantly clear when it's given. It's made abundantly clear over and over again. And the New Testament, referring back to it, makes it clear yet again. God did not give the law as a means for people to be saved. That was never the point. By the, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And the New Testament echoes, it's by grace are you saved through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. So he didn't give the law to say, here, if you do this, 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 and this, you'll be saved. No. That was never its purpose. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4 talk about how it was basically a schoolmaster, a teacher. It provided rules and structure that were intended to keep them living the right way, intended to keep them safe, literally safe, from, uh, from certain influences that were harmful to them. But it also taught them the valuable lesson that God is holy and perfect. And you can only have fellowship with God uh, through sacrifice. You can only have fellowship with God through that perfection, which you can't achieve on your own. The law taught us that we could never keep it. The law has within it a curse which Christ broke because he perfectly fulfilled the law on our behalf and died in our place. The Mosaic Covenant was conditional and temporary. It was not a part of the Abrahamic Covenant. And so at the cross, it came to an end. It is no more. Uh, how, do, how, do, how do Christians then relate to the law? That's a popular question. Um, the Mosaic Law literally has zero bearing on the life of a New Testament believer. A lot of people get a little bit upset when you say that because you think, well, what about the Ten Commandments, which stand as kind of a, an illustration of, of the full extent of the law? Uh, we are not under the Mosaic Law. That's, that's as clear as it can be made. But Jesus did indicate that there were certain portions of the, the law, those Ten Commandments especially, which still had a place in the life of New Testament believers. But we, we now are under the law of Christ as believers. That's what the New Testament teaches. And the law of Christ might include some of the same standards that the law of Moses had, but that doesn't mean it is the law of Moses. Um, because the law of Moses has come to an end. And we're not under that covenant any longer, and it was never meant for us to begin with. That brings us to the uh, next of these covenants, the Palestinian covenant. I'm not going to spend very much time here because uh, it is, an, it is a, a kind of a, a sub-covenant, basically, of the Abrahamic covenant. It deals specifically with the land. So the Abrahamic covenant dealt with all those promises, personal, national, and universal. And then God made additional covenants along the way to reaffirm certain portions of that covenant. The Palestinian covenant is God's reaffirmation of the specific portion of land that he promised to Abraham and his descendants. It is an everlasting covenant because it is simply a portion of the Abrahamic covenant. It's everlasting. It's unconditional. So, um, 
it, it reaffirms God's commitment to give the land area to Israel. It also uh, develops and adds important truth related to the land. Um, there is a significant difference, by the way, between ownership of land and uh, actually living on the land and enjoying its blessings. So it's theirs because God gave it to them. But right now, they're not enjoying the full extent of that land. You, as you know very well, if you watch the news, there's, it's, it's a battleground <laughs> fighting over who owns it. God already settled who owns it. Okay, it's, It belongs to his people. And ultimately, they will live on all of it. Uh, but right now, they don't get to enjoy that. And that's consequences for how they disobeyed him when they lived in it the first time. They had it. They conquered it. Joshua led the conquest. They spread out and lived in their land. But what did they do? They let the outsiders come back in, pollute it with their uh, false teachings. They turned away from God and God plucked them out of their land. And they, they don't get to enjoy it again yet until God is finished doing what he's doing. So it's theirs because God promised it to them, but they don't enjoy it right now. And they have lost the privilege of actually dwelling in it because of their disobedience. But that has not annulled the covenant. Um, it will be fulfilled in the future. Then we have, we're getting close to the end of these covenants here, the Davidic covenant, which is another amplification of the Abrahamic covenant and deals specifically with the kingdom that God promised uh, to the descendants of Abraham. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. We don't have time to read all of this, but let me read a couple of verses and at least get you to make note of where you can find this. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 13. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So David is promised that uh, he will have this everlasting kingdom. Now, how does that work out? There's five basic parts. I'll give them to you quickly here. Number one. David would have a great name that was fulfilled in his own lifetime and throughout history. To this day, if you were to ask who the greatest king of Israel uh, in all of history was, they would say King David. Uh, so his, his name would be great. That was the first promise. It's already been fulfilled. Second, David would have rest from his enemies. This was also one of the realities during his lifetime as God neutralized the power of surrounding nations. Third, he was promised that his house would last forever. He would have a house that would last forever. The word house does not refer to a physical building, but to a physical line of descendants. God guaranteed that the line of David would endure forever and would never be cut off. It would eventually lead to Christ himself, but it has still continued, of course, to this day. Then we have the fourth of those promises that David's throne would be established forever his throne and the throne speaks of the ruling authority this is the guarantee that the right to rule would always belong to david's dynasty and would never pass away permanently even though there might be times when it wouldn't be exercised so david had a line of kings but obviously there is no kingdom of israel at this time but god will keep his promise um, because look at the fifth promise here. His kingdom would never end. It would never pass away permanently. At times, the kingdom would not exist as a kingdom. But, as one scholar said, even if historically interrupted for a season, the Jews will at last, in a future kingdom, be restored to the nation in perpetuity with no further possibility of interruption. Now, how does this get carried out in the future? It's quite simple. The Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, who is of the seed of David, will ultimately fulfill this promise because he will sit on the throne there in Jerusalem, ruling over the world from that place. Uh, and the promise made to David will be fulfilled during the millennium and onward. There's one more covenant. 
And it is what we call, what the Bible calls, the new covenant. The new covenant is found in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Again, I would encourage you to take note of that. Make sure you know where the new covenant is found. It gets quoted also in the New Testament. This passage in Jeremiah 31 is very important. It's easy to remember because it's Jeremiah 31, 31, in fact, where this begins. It says, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This is the new covenant. And this like the other covenants that developed the Abrahamic covenant, it is eternal, it is unconditional. It is compared specifically to the Mosaic covenant. That's what, he's, that's what he means when he says, not like the covenant I made before when I brought them out of Egypt. It's not like that covenant. He said they broke that covenant. Even though I gave them everything they needed, they broke that one. This covenant is not like that. Now, let's give some details of this and we'll be done. Those involved in the covenant are the people of Israel. The promises of the new covenant are primarily spiritual in nature, though there are some material blessings related to the land that get included here. Um, in the new covenant, God provides for the salvation of Israel. That's the major promise here. That doesn't mean that every member of the house of Israel and the house of Judah will be saved or will be regenerated, uh, but it does mean that the nation of Israel will come back to God at some point in the future. Uh, it's described in a number of different places, but probably the most poignant one is in Zephaniah when it talks about the fact that, or Zechariah, when it says they will look on him whom they have pierced and they will weep and mourn for him. There will be a time when Christ returns, they will look on him and recognize him for who he is and as a nation, they will repent and turn to him. And those individuals who put their faith in him, just like throughout all history, any Jewish person today can put their faith in Christ and be saved. That can happen anytime. But what he's saying is there will be a time when the nation will accept him for who he is. Because it was the nation that rejected Jesus Christ when he stood before them the first time. Individuals trusted him. There were Jewish people that trusted him then. But the nation represented by its leaders, rejected him. But when he comes back, that will not be the case. And so there will be this regeneration of Israel. There will be forgiveness of sins. Uh, it also guarantees the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which will make it possible for the people to be empowered to obey the Lord with an attitude free of stubbornness and rebellion and no need for the law to tell them what to do because the Holy Spirit of God living within them teaches them and guides them as it does us as New Testament believers. Um, the presence of the Holy Spirit will also enable people to have an experiential and full knowledge of the Lord. Now, whenever the, uh, whenever the Old Testament prophets spoke about uh, the new covenant, they viewed it as something yet future, always. The fulfilling of this covenant was inseparably tied to Israel's future restoration to the land. So it was going to happen at the same time. So when you read through, especially like the account in Ezekiel, how many of you have heard of the, the, the Valley of Dry Bones? A lot of people like to talk about that. A lot of preachers like to preach on that and apply it to anything and everything in the world. Uh, it's a specific prophecy about Israel's future restoration. The fact that he was told to speak to those dry bones. The bones came back together and then were covered with the muscle and the skin and then the breath of life was put into them. That's a very specific prophecy that in the future, Israel will be regathered physically. All the bones coming back together, that's Israel coming back together in their land physically. And then the breath of life being put into them, that's the regeneration. That's the coming of the Holy Spirit and all those things. 
uh, giving them spiritual life. So it's, it's going to happen as one major event in the future. Um, the final and complete fulfillment of the new covenant with Israel will be in the future millennial kingdom of the Messiah. That leaves one question for us to answer then. Where does the church fit into the new covenant? I mean, the whole second half of the Bible we call the New Testament, which basically means the new covenant. There are a lot of different views about how the new covenant relates to us as the church. Well, the church does not fulfill the new covenant given to Israel, just like the church doesn't fulfill any covenants made with Israel. The new covenant was made with Israel, not with us. But the church does partake in the blessings of the new covenant, some of them, but not all of them. The land, that's specifically for them. But the spiritual benefits we are benefiting from. Why? Because this new covenant was sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed on the cross. And so all of us who are born-again believers, uh, also bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, experience the same spiritual blessings that, that they will experience when they turn to him. As members of the body of Christ, we, like Israel in the future, are regenerated, indwelt, forgiven, and taught by the Holy Spirit. But these promises are, and these blessings are unrelated to the national promises having to do with the restoration to the land and the blessings related to that land. Israel alone receives those in the future. But we benefit from those blessings. It's been uh, compared to a, a tree planted in one backyard that grows up and covers and shades a second backyard. We're in, the, we're in the neighboring yard, and we get the blessings, but that tree was not planted with us and for us in that sense. All right. Now, here's the last thing I'm going to show you just to whet your appetite for what's coming the next two nights. This was, uh, this was the foundation, okay? A lot of detail. Is everyone still alive? Okay. <laughs> I'm in teacher heaven, but I know what it's going to be like to be out there, all right? Uh, this, is, this is not the best, this is, I, let me correct myself. This is one of the best representations of a chart like this I've seen, but I cannot find it in a reproducible form, so you're going to see it scanned, and, I, and it's, it doesn't live up to my standards of graphic design. But nonetheless, this is a, a timeline of future events, an overview of future events, which is what I know people are very interested in, in understanding. So I want you to see this. We'll see this again tomorrow. And I'll see if my laser pointer works. There it goes. This is where we are right here, people. The church age. This is where we're living. And the next thing that we expect on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. When Christ comes in the clouds and the church goes up to meet him in the air. And immediately following that, we have the seven years of tribulation. And that's when Christ will come back to judge, establish his kingdom, Ultimate judgment, new heavens and new earth, follow that. Got it? <laughs> That's all you need to know. Okay, so tomorrow night and the next night, we will deal with these major events here. The rapture, tribulation period, and the judgments and things uh, related to the second coming of Christ. It's 8.01. Not too bad. All right.